little panic for upstairs when I'm not having this on. <laughs> but we are we're a good team. They are they did a good job. Just give them a round of applause for the you know, a Friday they came and they did a wonderful job. I tell you the uh, live stream is being a blessing, you know. And a lot of people work um, uh, tirelessly in our church, you know, for uh, all that they do for the Lord. And the one is the trustees do a great job, Tom and, uh, and others try to keep up these properties. And Ray and Tracy, they particularly take care of the trees and the lawns and uh, the grass and, you know, uh, reseeding them. <laughs> Oh, they do a, put all their hearts, you know, yesterday they were working and they, Ray walked up to me with two fruit. Look at that. This is an apple and this is a pear. These both came from our trees in front of the office. Yeah, right. Uh, maybe I will. But I said, you know, I said, okay, Ray, what do you want me to do with this? Well, are we not supposed to thank the Lord for our first fruits in the Bible? <laughs> right, Ray? You know, all the produce, all the vegetables we grow in our gardens, we take them for granted. But in the end, who gives the growth? The Lord, right? I want to thank the Lord for these two fruits. Whoever will get to eat, if whoever comes first, they'll get these fruits. No, let's thank the Lord for these. And maybe we'll pray that there'll be more such fruits. The whole Herald Street could eat and... Uh, Holy Sharon can be fed, maybe. Lord, dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness in our lives. For all the good produce, Lord, the heaven and earth is blessed because you kindly look at the earth, sending rain when it is needed and, and crop, producing the crops so that the mankind could live on and the fruits and the vegetables and, um, and all the the green uh, greenery around the trees. We thank you, Lord, for all your kindness. We thank you for this, these apples and pears, Lord, for from our own uh, trees in front of the church. May this be a blessing to others. Uh, may they bear much fruit so that we may get to enjoy this fruit. And now, Lord, we pray that the, uh, the, the gospel seeds that will go forth uh, uh, through preaching, they will bear fruit, Lord God. And we all will bear fruit. As you said, Lord, you called us so that we, we, we bear much fruit for your namesake. So, Lord God, teach us and help us to be bearing fruit, uh, fruit-bearing Christians. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, up for grabs. Uh, actually, maybe we should auction them. What do you think? <laughs> the, the first one is uh, $100. No, that's... Uh, there is, um, is, is a good way to honor the Lord. Um, this is something in general is the feeling, but uh, some exceptions are there too. By nature, uh, humans are ambitious people. Are they not? Humans are ambitious, right? We all here, if I ask, we all want to do something good with our lives. Is there anyone who wants to do something bad? You know, all we want to do something good with our lives and leave a good legacy or a, a good uh, significant footprint uh, behind. No one particularly wants to be intentionally a cheat or a crook. And when you ask children, you know, somehow they come up with some great ideas, great, great answers, right? Ask them what they want to become when they grow up. They usually say what? I want to become like Michael Jordan, all these basketball players, right? Or uh, Steph Curry, or a film actor, or uh, a doctor, or an engineer. But some kids have some funny answers for that questions. I found a few of these funny uh, questions about uh, kids' ambitions. You know, they have ambitions, right? Some kids said like this. One person said, when I grow up, I want to be a customer in a store. I will buy broccoli, tomatoes, and carrots, and when I get home, I will make soup with them. Oh, boy, mother is drilling about vegetables maybe, right? And someone else said, I want to be a person who cleans tables. Great ambition. 
And one said, I will one day become a potato. <laughs> Where did he got that? And someone said, I want to be a wolf. Well, someone else said, I want to be a Batman. When uh, one girl said, when I grow up, I want to be like my mommy. So sweet, right? I want to be like a mommy. You know, we laugh at these uh, ambitious uh, aspirations of children. For example, to be a potato or, uh, or a wolf, some may or may never happen. When I, wanted, when I was growing up, I wanted to be two things. I wanted to be a bus conductor and I wanted to be, wanted to be a pilot. One is down to earth and one up in the sky, right? Well, thank God none of those two happened and I became a... Uh, pastor, and I tell you, I would not trade this for anything in the world. Being a pastor, being a shepherd of the flock. Give me anything to me, but give the pastor, I will take this. That I would get to do the, the, the work of Jesus, bringing the words to people. And uh, as a, I'm a sheep myself, as I am feeding myself, from God's word, I want you to be feeding on the good pasture. And in the end, the good shepherd is feeding all of us, and we will grow together. So in, just to get us going, what is ambition? I found uh, this in definition in uh, uh, LinkedIn, you know, on the website. They have uh, they've put it this way. Ambition means a strong desire to do or achieve something in life. Ambition gives us aims, objectives, and goals, and targets in life. It gives us a sense of direction and motivation toward our goals in life. Do we all need ambition? Right? We all do. Without it, we remain purposeless and useless. Well, it's one thing to have an ambition, but another thing to have the right ambition. Amen? Do you agree with that? The right one. Anybody could have ambition. The right ambition. What is that? Uh, there are some quotes I found very interesting here. Uh, Napoleon uh, Hill uh, quoted, uh, said this, There is one weakness in people for which there is no remedy. It is the universal weakness of lack of ambition. Many are having that. And jo John D. Rockefeller has uh, uh, his quote here on ambition. The man who starts out simply with the idea of getting rich won't succeed. You must have a larger ambition. I wonder what was his definition of a larger ambition? A larger ambition. Last week, we looked at, uh, from our reading of the scripture, we, we talked about how we fold our earthly tent. Remember? When the time comes, we all would fold our earthly tent. Uh, KK has folded hers, and uh, uh, Ali's dad, who also passed away recently, folded his. We all do uh, fold our tents. Then we will be transferred to our true home, that, I, that, is, that is our new bodies. And in today's passage, we will see what happens to us when we die. Continuation, we're dwelling on this for a while. And what should be the right and, should I say, the supreme ambition in life and death. And how we will be judged based on how we live on this earth. Considering all that, how can we live out our daily existence in this world? So depending on what kind of ambition you have, you know, that you order your priorities. But if you know the right one, and even much more so, you will order your priorities. So I want you to take to that place where you will find the right ambition. So stay with me. Verses 6 and 8, let's look at this. So we are always confident even though we know 
that as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Yes, we are fully confident and we rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we will be at home in the, with the Lord. In the uh, New American Standard Bible, slightly uh, translated, but I like that as well. Uh, verse 8, it says, But we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So there's lots going on in these verses, four verses. So much is packed in. I encourage you to go back and unpack even more than what I'm trying to explain from my uh, study into the Word. But you can get more out of this as you uh, uh, journey into this back again. What does this mean as long as we live in these bodies, we are not at home with the Lord? We had asked this question, what does it mean? It means while we are alive on earth, we are away from the Lord or from the fullness of God's presence. So what does it mean? Do we, does it mean that we do not enjoy the presence of God while we are still on the earth? What do you think? That's what it says to you. As long as we are on this earth, we are away from the Lord, full his presence. But what about while we are still here on the earth? Do we still enjoy the presence of the Lord? Of course we do. How do we do that? By the indwelling Holy Spirit inside of us, daily leading us into God's word through prayer, through praise, and through worship, and through fellowship when people of God come together. This is all we are enjoying the presence of God. But what does this mean is that the fullness of it is yet to come. Do you say amen for that? So what you're enjoying here is only partial, maybe 1% of the beautiful presence of God that is awaiting us. So that is, the, that is what he was looking forward to. Hey, that's what the, the tussle, we'll talk about it later. As long as I'm here on this earth, mm, I'm being prevented from having that fullness of God. So that's what it means. So then he goes on to, uh, uh, rather, Paul was kind of uh, uh, um, uh, deep, he's, he's looking deep into his own need. It looked like as if he was uh, heaven sick, homesick, you know, uh, the homesickness that he was having, that he wanted to go back and be with the Lord. Uh, to to uh, express that in verse 8, it says, but we are of good courage. And prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So he's making his true intentions clear here. You know, he prefers something, something better than what is happening in the earth. You know, so he's preferred that than this. That's the idea. So what does this mean here? Uh, to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So Paul uh, states here with his co with confidence, he says, uh, his eternal destiny, and, and he longs for the day when he can be absent from the body and be present with the Lord he loves and serves. To be absent from one's body means to, to die. When we, when we die, we leave uh, 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 this earthly body uh, at death. But whereas the spirit, the soul, uh, gets on to be with, with uh, into uh, other realm it moves into, uh, um, into the realm of God. And it's separated from the body and moves into its eternal uh, uh, permanent place. Well, it could be in two places. There's no limbo in between. It could be either into heaven with the Lord or hell separated from God for eternity. But the, the, um, when that transfer happens into heaven and uh, hell uh, is something that we can talk about a little bit more. Uh, but the, the final destinations would be either heaven or hell. Uh, um, for those who believe in Christ will go to heaven. Those who do not will be separated from God in uh, uh, eternity in hell. So Paul's struggle here might be kind of the struggle that you and I go through in our own lives. 
whether to remain in the earthly body that is not cooperating with us, you know, is not uh, as, uh, we're not 20 anymore, like, you know, uh, how we were, we used to run and do all kinds of things. Um, and uh, so we struggle whether to remain in this earthly body or to be with God in heaven. You know, I was singing that song, John, what you just sang in 1985. I was, uh, as I gave my life to Jesus, I was so young, and the greatest thing I thought, I want to know God with all my heart. I want to love him with all my heart. I want to serve him till the day I, uh, until the day I die, as long as I live on this earth. I even said to myself, until the last drop of my blood, I would speak the goodness of Jesus Christ. For me, he was the greatest treasure I wanted to run after. I was young. I tell you, I still have not given up that. I still want to keep pursuing God, the one who took hold of me. There is a struggle that we go through, living in the earthly body or to go and be with God in heaven. I tell you, that would be the most beautiful place. Amen? To be with God is the most beautiful place. No trouble whatsoever. No one is going to bully you in heaven. By the way, the bullies won't get into heaven in the first place. So they, they have another place. But so it is going to be a wonderful place there. So here he was expressing his struggle to the Philippian believers uh, as he was writing from a Roman prison. But let's look at that. Philippians 1, 21, 24. This is personal struggle of Paul. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. But if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really do not know which is better. I am torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which is, would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to to live. Here Paul's desire, the tussle that he's going through. What is his tussle here? Can I stay here or can I go? And he's making sure of his ambition uh, in life that was to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. If he lived, he could continue to labor for the Lord. Uh, but if he, have fa if he faced the execution, he would depart this life and be with Christ. He desired to be with his Savior. But he remained on earth because he could continue to serve the believer, Corinthian believers, or Ephesian believers, Ephesus believers, or other places around the world, that he would continue to do the work for the Lord. And then that was, that's what he was choosing. You know I, I, you know, I can identify with that struggle in my life. I would rather be with God in heaven. But if I live on earth... For my wife's sake and for my children's sake and for the, for the church, and I would, that would be a better service for the Lord. So you got to come to that place of that one day we will leave, but where would I go to be with, with God? That is the Paul. Paul made it that very clear uh, in, his, uh, in his life. And uh, uh, then he was, he says, uh, if you read uh, verse 6 and 8, uh, I don't know whether you can put that out there again, uh, uh, verses 6 and 8. So we are confident, right? It says that, right? Uh, so we are, in those two verses, let me uh, uh, share with me what is one word that comes out regularly, or at least more than once. Yep. Can you say that confidently? Confident. Yes, confident, that's right. Confident, you know, think of that. What is confidence? You can absolutely do it. You know, it's a firm confidence. I have that confidence. I, I, I got this. You know, some people say, I, I got it. That means, yes, probably he's got, he or she has that confidence that he could do that. Uh, uh, you know, that word confidence comes frequently in the second letter to Corinthians. The, in the whole Bible, about 68 times that word confidence came. 
10 times in this word, in this chapter, in this letter. So that, that to Paul was certain. He was absolutely certain about why he was here on this earth, where he was going to go uh, when he leaves this earth. The, the courage, the confidence there. It means, you know, the confidence uh, uh, means here uh, uh, firm trust, you know, absolute trust. Uh, it's uh, how could Paul say this? Because he followed the, uh, other people's lives like King David. And at one point he says, I have the same faith as King David. So he was kind of building up as he came to this point of saying King David's faith was so uh, uh, palatable. People could look at him uh, despite of all the hardships, he would still love the Lord. Amen. You know, he says, how, why are you so discouraged to mow my soul within me and all that? But then he what says? He says, yet I will praise God. So this, that's the faith of David. So let's see what uh, uh, David has said here. Psalm 112, uh, verse 6. Why, we, why you and I can be confident. The righteous can be confident. He says, they means the righteous do not fear bad news. They... They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. You know, look at that. Is there so much bad news these days? You know, about the economy. And people are worried about what's going to happen. The gas prices may be doing a little better. But, uh, you know, we walk into some stores, there are no supplies. You know, the uh, uh, supply chain problems and uh, the war in between Ukraine and uh, uh, Russia, would Russia trigger a nuclear bomb? We don't know what will happen if that happens. So much of bad news. But for you, you can be confident. Amen? You are righteous. You love the Lord. If you know Jesus, you can be confident because they will not be afraid of bad news. What, 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 the, what worse could happen to, to you and me, to the people of God? We will die. Then what happens? Hallelujah, you are in the presence of God. So is there anything to be afraid of? So that's the place we need to come to. Yes, as long as God would allow me to live in this earth, I will enjoy it is fruitful labor and service for my family, for me, uh, for the society. But this is not permanent. I'm going to move on to a place, much better place. So therefore, I will not be afraid of all this bad news that comes through all these medias, whatever the channel that you look at, a lot of bad news. And in our lives, we go through a lot of hard times. Let's face that. Some are more than the others, but we all do go through hard times. But this is the confident, comforting thing. The people of God, they will put their firm trust in God, who created the heavens and the earth. Why are we so confident? Because we don't live by what we see. We live by what we do not see, right? We live by faith in God. That's what that gives us confidence. So with that, we can hope for heaven that we have not seen. How do we do that? Because the Bible tells me so. You know, uh, Billy Graham, uh, uh, I, I need to check that, but there's uh, someone said about Billy Graham had this argument, or uh, he says, uh, I believe, the, uh, he always says, the Bible says so. The Bible says so, right? You know, uh, and um, the argument goes like this. Uh, you know, the Bible says uh, uh, Jonah was in the uh, be uh, uh, belly of a big fish for three days and three nights. And I believe that. Why? Because the Bible says so. What if other way around? If the big whale was in the belly of Jonah for three days and three nights, if it is in the Bible, I would still believe so. There are things that are, you know, beyond our comprehension, but the word of God is something that, you know, the heaven and the earth shall pass away, but the word of God will never pass away. So we got to come to grip, grip ourselves, anchor ourselves around the word of God. And when we move from, you know, that's what we, that's the confidence Paul, Paul was exuding here. Uh, Daniel uh, uh, gives us another uh, uh, perspective to everybody, what happens to all mankind when they die. 
uh, verse, uh, Daniel verse 12, chapter 12, verse 2. It says, many of those whose bodies lie dead and buried will rise up, some to everlasting uh, life and some to shame and everlasting disgrace. That's what happens to everybody. All the bodies would rise up one day. They will come to a place, some to go to be with, uh, uh, with God forever, others away from God. So when a born-again believer like you and me, when he or she dies, his soul immediately enters the Lord's presence in conscious bliss, uh, awaiting the grand resurrection day. So the dead will rise one day. So that is called the, the, the uh, uh, second or final resurrection uh, uh, that happens. So when, what will that be like? When that happens, what's, what is going to happen? That is going to be the, the, the culmination of the world, the final judgment. That's what the Bible talks about. Uh, here uh, in verse 10, Paul uh, gives a, a glimpse of what will be like that day. What happens when we all come before the judgment seat of Christ? Uh, verse 10. It says, for we must all stand before Christ to be judged. The highest court, this, the uh, more powerful than the Supreme Court, the God's court. God is the judge. We will stand before that judge. And here it is. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Dear friends, unfortunately, many people live irresponsibly as though they give no account to anybody, let alone to God. But there will come a day. There will come a day, as the Bible is teaching us. It is appointed for men and women to die once and then come into uh, judgment uh, uh, after they die. That this is the day, what Paul was already envisioning, that we all must, we all must be standing before Jesus Christ and give an account of what I have done in my life. People in the world may evade justice. The system, they can just circumvent and do all kinds, say all kinds of lies and, uh, and, over, uh, and then get away, not getting caught ever. But I tell you, you and I could never get away facing the righteous judge. And he is righteous and then he will make a, the right judgment call. And then that judgment, judgment call will be, all those who believed in Jesus will be going to be with heaven, to be with him in heaven, and others will be going to hell. So that's, I've been kind of bringing that again and again, but just, I want us to get this. So, considering that, considering all what I have said, what should be our lives like? What should be our ambition? If you want to now Probably rethink about your ambition. This is the time. What should be our ambition? Verse 9. Uh, look at this. So whether we are here in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. Do you say amen to that? Our goal is to please God. Do you say amen? Is that your goal? And that's the thing that put, is it your ambition? That's what it says. Therefore, we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. That's what NASB tells us here. Here, Paul was speaking of his only aim, the right aim in life. Paul's ambition is not like the ambition that we find in English language. The proud ambition, selfish ambitions, selfish desires that are often expressed to that word when we say, I'm ambitious. But Paul, the, you know, the, in the Greek, where, Greek word that translated in, in other uh, version, um, ESV, it says, that my aim, my aim. What is that, the word? It means to love what is honorable. Amen. Paul wants to do and love the things that are honorable. Many people love and do things that are not so honorable. You know, 
uh, uh, dishonorable things they do and uh, 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 things that we don't want to even talk about. But Paul's aim is, I want to do that is which is honorable to God. My aim is what he says, to please God. And Paul, uh, um, but by the way, he demonstrated that throughout his life, hasn't he? You know, he did all that he could do to honor God in his life. Um, so it's so fitting for him even to say that uh, that has been my goal. And let's see how he pursued that li that life's uh, uh, life's ambition, his goal to please God, to to look up and run to the uh, to receive that prize, that heavenly prize that God has prepared for him. Uh, that the in Philippians third chapter, verse thirteen and fourteen. If you can turn to that. Brethren, brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The greatest thing in my life, all my life, is to know God love God, and to serve God. He says, I consider everything as, uh, in, uh, elsewhere he said, uh, as garbage. So dear friends, let me bring this to us. In, when, uh, uh, when you compare this, living, uh, living in, the, uh, 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 in heaven, when you think of that, uh, whatever place that you live here on the earth is like you're living in a garbage dump, whatever that is, whatever fancy place you can, uh, Beverly Hills or whatever you may call, a fancy one. But compared to the place that we are going to give, is nothing. So let's have the detachment and have the detachment with God and his word, knowing that it says God has taken hold of me in one place. It says he, he, he held me for this upward call. Amen. You have made for better things in life. God has taken you out for better things. So therefore you run towards that while discarding all that may be pulling us away from God. So that's what he says. I made it my goal. My, the right ambition, my goal is to please God. In other words, I want to do what things that are honorable. Please him in life and death. That was the right ambition for Paul. So it should be our ambition as well for all people, all believers. The right ambition is to please God. Think of that. Pleasing God? Can God be pleased? Is there something that you and I can do to please him? What a tall order that is. How can he be pleased? He's got everything. Is there something that you and I can do make him more happy than what he already has? Well, there is much to be done. Pleasing God is possible. God will be pleased. But you know what? There are many things God is displeased about as well. There are many things that God, many things that people and all that, there are some things that he doesn't like. For example, idolatry, he doesn't like it. And child sacrifice or uh, uh, you know, people do, do he, evil things. Yeah, in the sixth chapter of Proverbs, you see there are seven things. He says, God hates uh, uh, pride and lying, murder, evil plots. And he says, those who love evil are those who bear false witness and those who do make all these troubles, you know, troublemakers. God doesn't like all this. God doesn't like, God doesn't like sin. Uh, and, uh, and those who, who s sin at the same time, there is uh, uh, some of th that's something God doesn't like. But at the same time, God wants everybody to be saved, all people to be saved. So here, Paul's goal, your goal is to please him. Now, let me ask you, how many of you want to please God today? 
I can see everyone wants to please God. So stay with me. I'll give you a few pointers that might help you to please God. Number one, first of all, who are the best people to, that we, you want to follow when it comes to pleasing God? Who could be our model? Jesus. You get 100 points. My Greek professor would say, if you don't know the answer, say, Jesus, you pass. I'll pass you. <laughs> so Jesus is our number one model. And next, what? Paul. Because Paul would say, as I imitated Christ, you imitate me. So if you follow this, I tell you, we are in good, good ground. So this is what Jesus said about following, following God, doing things that are pleasing to God. Uh, John 8, chapter verse 29, it says, And the one who sent me is with me. He has not deserted me, for I always do what pleases him. Think of that. Jesus was saying, what I always do, what pleases God. And if Jesus could do that, and then, and, the, and Paul could do that, there are some things that you and I could do. So there are certain things that you could do right now that would please God. What are they? Number one, when we live by faith and do not doubt God's character, it pleases God. Hebrews 11th chapter, verse 6, what it says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. There it is. There it is. You just already lost 100 points if you, if you doubt God's presence, if you're having unbelief. But if you're having faith, ha, ah, God is pleased. Amen? When you live by faith. That's what Paul says. We don't live by sight. We live by faith. It's impossible to uh, please God without faith. Number two, you know, it says anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Uh, number, uh, in Romans, it talks about we please God when we live holy lives and offer bodies as living, our bodies as living sacrifices. That is pleasing to God, living holy lives. First Thessalonians second chapter verse four, when we go out and share the good news of the gospel uh, uh, to others, that is pleasing to God. That's why come to Sharon Day uh, event or go to uh, uh, outreach in Sudden. Those are the opportunities when you can share the good news of the gospel. You know, the other day, one, pa one of our friends, uh, uh, Elijah Kim, uh, he was sharing the good news of the gospel from Korea in Boston Commons. He's preaching, whether people listen or not, but he's bringing the word, and they, that pleases the Lord. And then, how about good works? When we do good works, God is pleased. This is what it says, Hebrews 13, 16. And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that please God. So they've got already, you already got a few tools, a few things that you could practice that will be pleasing to God. And there are many more as you read the word. But can we make, uh, John, please make your way and uh, the worship team, as they are coming up today, what is your ambition? Check yourself again today. Is pleasing God is the right ambition? Is pleasing God is the goal that you could make in your life and my life. I tell you, when we do that, we will not be disappointed. And when we do that, God will reward us richly, not only here in this world, but in the world to come. So let's stand up together as we are offering ourselves as, as living sacrifices to the Lord and, and making our God, you know, you're struggling with priorities. Well, this is what you can do. Keep Jesus as your topmost priority in life. And I tell you, he will, he will do a lot of good to yourself and to the others as well. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more for heaven now to give he is my joy my righteousness and freedom my steadfast love my deep and boundless peace to this 
sure the price is been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin has been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chief I tell you, there's going to be a joy in heaven. There'll be rejoicing in heaven when we all get there. And that is the beautiful place that we can be together with him for thousands and thousands of years, for eternity, reigning with Christ. Oh, what a beautiful thing that would be. So let's look forward to that as we follow Christ. Lord, Lord, as we leave this place, we ask you, Lord, you would send us with your presence. The love of the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit will be with us forever and ever. Amen. And God bless you, and we will see you. For apple and pear. <laughs> apple pie, yes.